Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Shepherd's Corner, conversations with Archbishop Charles Jason Gordon. And we're talking about whether or not God exists. Do you believe? That's why I put on my white alb today, you understand? Because this is a heavy topic. And I know that some of you all have to go into your biology, you know, and, and you put on your science caps to really get into this conversation. Life, chance, or design is is what we're talking about today. Good evening, Archbishop Scientist Charles Jason Gordon. How are you going? <laughs> Good evening, Reverend Deacon. Are you doing okay, though? What I want to tell people is today's show, yeah, yeah, buckle up. You know, buckle up. Okay. Now, you don't have to follow all of the argument that we're going to do or all of the exploration we're going to do. But here's what, here's what, it, what it is. Is that there is a there is a purpose and there is a point to it, and uh, for the young ones doing science, I want them to follow the purpose and the point. So if, if you're not doing it, just trust that there is a purpose and there is a point, and that that is important for all of us to understand that we have a reason, a good reason to believe that you know. God is God. And, you know, that is the synopsis of this one. And it comes from our understanding of life and biology and understanding the, the key or the core inside of the, the, the biological chemical structure. It's very technical, but don't worry, you know. Just hang in for the ride and let's... Let, 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 let. And you know, with everybody, you always get in this follow the science we want only to follow the science study you know what i mean you know what i mean you know what i mean so, so my question yeah let me drop, drop the question on you why do you uh -huh. believe god exists well you know this is this is the third time we're talking this you know and i have a lot, at least three more to come in <laughs> but i promise you these are the most technical it, it gets lighter after this the the modern atheism and the conflict between faith and science reaches real crescendo with the publication of Charles Darwin on the origin of species, which was in 1859, a hundred years before I was born. Eh? 100 years. Now, Darwin argued that although species and their parts look like they have an intelligent design, this is just an illusion. So, I want you to understand, up until Charles Darwin, every scientist believed that the creation story was a major story. After Charles Darwin, people started to ask, is the creation story the real story? And, and once people started to ask that question, of course, we start getting unstuck and realizing that the, the, the question about God and creation is a really serious question. Because if we can prove that science has a way of explaining everything that we know without ref reference to God or creation, then do we need to believe in God? That's the conundrum. Simple and as straightforward as that. If we, could, if we could prove Darwin right, that although species look like they have an intelligent design, they really don't have an intelligent design. That's just an illusion because of the number of times that evolution has happened that makes it look like if um, it was an, a design, but it's really, it's really only an accident, a fluke, that it all turned out this way. This is the heart of the of the scientific conundrum with faith. And, and for a long time it's been either science or faith. I see in your in, in your article you said Darwin argued that although species and their parts look like they have an intelligent design, this is just a delusion. Yeah. I, I, I can't believe that. It's just a delusion. Well, that's what the man argue. That that so 
when you when you look at the animals, animals have a face, they have eyes, they have mobility, parts of their body that allow mobility. If they're on the land, feet, um, if they the water fins. Um, when you when, when you dissect an animal, they have a lot of the living parts that we have doing similar functions that we have. Um, animals, reptiles uh, have slightly different ways of doing stuff. They all have to extract oxygen to keep alive. Um, so it looks like it looks like a, a, a design um, across all the, the spectrum of, of animals. It looks that way. Darwin was, you know, just pure chance. <laughs> Just pure chance. It's an illusion, and the illusion has come from the number of the times this has happened, and it has, it has eliminated the oddities that might have been in the system during, during this, this, the phase of evolution. Well, I, I'm seeing that he said, you know, that what he talked about um, just a purely undirected process. What looks like design is really natural selection, he calls it. Yes. The, the, if we understand what Darwin is saying, what looks like purpose and design is not really purpose and design. It's really illusion, purely undirected process then, you know, a lot of our assumption about the world is now thrown into, into mayhem and confusion. Right. Okay. And, and this was the revolution of Charles Darwin in, the, in 1859 when he published his, his, um, his groundbreaking book uh, on the origin of species. So, which one is it? Which one is it? And that's that's what the debate between faith and science has been for the hundred and how many ever years? I should know, 162 years. <laughs> since the publication of the work. And and it it has really taken us by storm. But you know, Homer and Iliad had the dialogue between people those the younger generation that had no reference for the gods at all and the older generation that did everything mm -hmm. by the will of the and by the the dictates of the gods and and that this dialogue that is happening with us now we've done this before in history and that that's that to me is an interesting thing so recently i looked at the movie troy and, and in, in, in that movie, um, Hector, who is the son of the king, um, who is the warrior, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, ha has no 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 room for prophecy and these things. This this is cold reason, and and in fact, because of of, of the the fathers leaning towards prophecy, um, they they had an advantage before and they gave up their, their, their advantage because of their fathers leaning towards um, soothsayers and, and um, diviners who were speaking so on, on behalf of the gods. And Hector was advising, that's not the way to go. That's not, and, and he was telling them why, but they wouldn't listen. So this, um, and then he had Achilles who was absolutely disrespectful of all the gods. Uh, um, plundered the temples and, and, and desecrated that and said, well, well where, where are the gods' punishment to me now? And so this, is, this modern conversation we are having is, is a very old conversation, is what I want to start by saying. And that's a comforting thing. <clears throat> because if, if 20, 26, 2700 years after their conversation, we still have any conversation, that says something, that alone says something to you. <laughs> that alone says something to you. That the conversation is not going away. And if it's not going away, why is it not going away? And that also says something to you. And, and so 
that's where I kind of want to start with this natural, um, is it design or is it natural selection? <clears throat> the, the religious position has always been is design, clearly. Look at it. There's no reason for it to exist. It has to be designed. The scientific uh, perspective with Darwin on says, design what? That's just natural selection. That's just how it works. If you do this thing often enough, it starts to look like the same thing often enough. That's what, that's what random selection over a, a mega number of times starts to look like. Here's where we have the, 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 the faith meeting science and the challenge of this meeting. In the, in, in the conversation that emerges. So is it, is it um, Darwin or is it Genesis? That, that's a classic formulation of the, of the, of the, um, the question. And you have to, you have to understand a, a, a teenager um, learning about science and learning about evolution as they will in science, without understanding the subtleties that we will be exploring today, that teenager could be left to believe that it is all about science and therefore not anything about God. And that's why this program is important. So go grab your youngsters, especially those in university. You know, everybody is home these days. You know what I mean? And, and let, them, let them tune in to Shepherd's Corner. We're going to take them into a conversation. Life, chance, or design? design. Roll your dice. Roll your dice. Roll your... So before Darwin, Enlightenment philosophers, among them David Hume, had already dismissed the argument of design as a ground for religion based on sophisticated arguments. So he, he argued, no, no, no. This, this, this notion of design is foolish because, and then he, he demolished the notion of design. And so you, you had, um, before even Darwin, there, there was a growing movement. What Darwin did was create a further rift between science and religion. Science holding to evolution as the explanation of all that exists religion holding to creation, and, and God who intervened in the Big Bang, bringing space, time, and matter into, into being. And that is, that is, that is your, 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 your kind of division. That's your line in the sun, right there. That, that, that we can't cross it easy. Yeah. So which one is it? Is it that, is it that you know, um, evolution, as explained by Darwin, explaining all existence that we see, Big Bang and all? Or is it that we, we now um, have a God who is involved in Big Bang? Because remember, the Big Bang question is, who lit, who lit the, the flame? <laughs> somebody had to light the Big Bang. If you're going to have that kind of explosion, somebody had to light it. Why did it begin at that time? At that precise time, why, 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 why was it set off then? And and remember the laws, the laws of, of thermodynamics. You, you, uh, an object at rest stays at rest unless a force is, is acting upon it. Correct. So you can't you can't go into motion from nothing. Something has to send the thing into motion. But I don't hold, hold that thought for a moment. So is it, is it Big Bang without a cause? Or is it, is it a God who intervened in the Big Bang, Bang that brings space, time, and matter into being? Remember, before the Big Bang, there's no space, there's no time, there's no matter. Correctly. Okay? Mm -hmm. Before the Big Bang, no space, no time, no matter. Now, Big Bang happens, we have space, we have time, we have matter. So anything before the Big Bang is universal because there's no time. 
it, it, it is not conf confined by, by, by space or time or matter, anything before the Big Bang. Now that's classically how we define God. Eh? Outside of time, outside of space, outside of matter, or beyond time, space, and matter. That's classically and universal, has always existed, or eternal. That, that's that's kind of how we define God. But the whole of the horses for, for a moment. The, the, real, the real challenge that we have is this, this toss between whether it was a big bang or whether, whether it was uh, an intervention from, from some being that was eternal, that is eternal, that is outside of space, time, and matter. That's the question. Now, we have all of these young scientists watching us. We have all of these conversations about, you know, listen to the science. We're talking, we talk, we're talking about DNAs, RNAs, and all of these things that might change your DNA, you know. Uh, so this is an interesting conversation. Are they trying to change the design that God made? This is a question. And how you, how you deal with all those other things is really about um, like gene editing. Is, 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 that, is that attempting to change the design? Um, in a fundamental way. So all of these things are, are really part and parcel of what we what we trying to, to work through. But the unhappy coexistence has caused many a young person to ask the, the natural question, which of these is true? Correct. Which is true? Which can we actually trust? Design or God? Sorry, evolution or God? Only, only one of these could be true is the normal postulation. And we have some young scientists outside there who have gone hook, line, and sinker for the evolution, natural selection, and that's how it evolves. Correct. Correct. And, and I understand but we had to go further than that. We had to go a little deeper than that. Unfortunately, for most of the time since Darwin's publication, people have argued for the truth of one claim against the other claim. And this has led science to pronounce on metaphysics, thus proclaiming there is no God. Right. And, you know, what is science? Science is a method of observation of reality. Science is only a method. Eh? It's only a method, a way of observing reality where you, where you formulate theses until you can prove them as laws or discard them and formulate a new thesis. Science can't delve into the business of that which cannot be seen. It can only pronounce on that which is observable. And this is, this is fundamental here. And, and this, is, this is where the blurring of lines has, has happened. So, you know, when, when science starts to talk about that which cannot be seen, God, and pronounce that there is no God, it's no longer operating in the realm of science. Right. It's now operating in the, in the realm of metaphysics, which is a branch of a philosophy that starts to talk about all encompassing reality. Everything that exists is on this cosmic map. And what is on the map is always a question in metaphysics. And, and how does this map relate um, with, with each, all the pieces of the map relate with each other? So whether God is on the cosmic map or not, is not a matter that science could be qualified to speak about if it wants to remain science. What a conundrum. <laughs> what a conundrum. Because this then challenges, and I want, keep, I want young people and older people, because we have some, some, some scientists 
um, older scientists, uh, people are educators and so on. I want you all to hold that thought there. Don't write it off. I want you to hold the thought and let's dig deeper into this. Life, chance or design? That's the question today. And we are having a conversation with Archbishop G as we dig into this question. So, remember, science is only a method. A method of inquiry inquiry on that which is observable. So when science starts to pronounce on that which cannot be observed, science is on very thin ice, and it is no longer science. It's now metaphysics, philosophy, or I would even dare say, religion. Ah, I was bothered when you were to drop that one in. Because religion. we spoke about it last week, where we said it becomes religion. Are, they are they are actually a religion. It's actually it is a religion. And why is it a religion? Because it has a creed. And the creed, there is no God. That's a creed. Eh? Because it's a belief. Because it can't be it can't be proved. The creed, there is no God, actually directs a priori up front how the experimentation starts. Take Hawkins, who started by, by believing that the, the, the world always existed. He, believed, he started there because he wanted to disprove the Christian tradition and the Bible. He had to, he had to reverse it all the way back to the Big Bang and say, OK, it started at a particular time and, and space, time, and matter came into being. There was a singularity before that. Now, what we had in the explosion of that Big Bang is all matter that exists that we see, with time and space coming into being at that precise event. Now, that is how, that's a religious faith, atheism, postulating the assumptions that the scientist is using to formulate the experiment. So it is faith. Atheism is a faith because it can't be proven empirically. You can't, you, there's no scientist that has any experiment that could prove that God does or does not exist. It, it is outside of the realm of science. And I think we have to understand that. And, and that's what's what's really important here. So let's keep going. So there's an African proverb that goes, when the elephants fight, it's the grass that suffers. <laughs> <laughs> I like this. Science may only reasonably pronounce on the observable. And God is not in that realm. We'll discuss this in a, in a subsequent article. But, but just understand that science, when it fights with religion, is the little people that, that really suffer. It's the grass that starts to suffer. So we've seen from the perspective of cosmology, time, space, and matter came into being in the Big Bang. As we've also seen that nothing is set in motion without a cause. At this point, science has a fundamental question to answer. Who ignited the Big Bang? Who ignited it? How was it set in motion? That's a, that, that's a, a, a big, big question. When we turn to life and its origin, there are more fundamental questions to answer, including how did the first simple living organism come into being? That's where I want to focus today. So we looked at the cosmology last week. Now I want to delve into the first living organism that, that existed on planet Earth. How did it come into being? That, that's, that's, I think this is more of a conundrum than the, than the Big Bang and, the, and who ignited it. And, and I think that, that this conundrum is the one that is um, cook my noodles every time I contemplate it. It, it really... <laughs> gives me a, a, a heady um, a heady push because if 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 God if 
if we can show that the first living organism, the first simple cell that came into being, if we can show that that came into being in a process that needed no intervention from any outside interference, then we don't need God at all. Everything else comes from there. And then Darwin and evolution, we, we, could, we could start talking that way. If, however, that first thing, simple single cell with a, a, probably 150 amino acids in it, if that, if we can't explain how that could come into being on its own volition through some natural selection, NASA, we have a problem. <laughs> Calling home, we have a problem. No, this is not calling home. Yeah, well, calling home, God. <laughs> <laughs> the human race has a problem, and and that's that's real. That's that to me. When I put the two together, the the cosmological ar argument, if you like, mm -hmm. and the first simple cell argument, the two of them for me raises really pressing issues in terms of, of what what are we what are we talking about so the debate as the debate stands was life brought into being by chance or by intelligent design we would say god is intelligent design right super super intelligent design we would that's how we would say from our Darwin and company or the scientists will say, no, 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 purely by chance. Okay, but if we could prove that life came about purely by chance, then we don't need a creator. We really don't need a creator. Throw the creator out the window, throw religion with it, and let's go straight to science. That's, that's where the argument is, okay? But if it could be proven that the chance argument is improbable or even better, highly improbable, then the conversation about God remains squarely on the table. That's the conversation we have in some. And that is an important conversation because I can't see how the scientists can say, well, boy, it just happened. It became a process of evolution. Because it started, it started to talk like a theologian. <laughs> <laughs> when a scientist says, "When it just happened," yes, that now that's a belief. They know they they move from science to belief. Because I have, because I believe a priori, upfront, because I believe there is no God. Therefore, my assumption is. If I can't explain how the first form of life comes into being, I could just tell you it just happened. And you have to believe me as a matter of faith. I want you to hear the language. Yes, I'm listening. I'm as listening. a matter of faith, you have to believe me. And then once we could get to the first organism, we could get to the rest. Getting to the first one is the problem. The first one is the problem. And that's a, that's a challenge that, that, that has rocked the scientific world. So, you know, th this for me is a fundamental issue. Huh? So, in this in this work, I am I am following the logic of Stephen C. Meyer in his book Signature in the Cell: DNA and the Evidence for Intelligent Design, which was published in two thousand and nine. And and my technical information comes from him and from others that I have that dabbled into, um, but he has collected it in a coherent way a lot of the um, a lot of the evidence and a lot of the information. So I'm telling you up front, you could go and look for him. Um, I think he has some YouTube videos. Go and look at his YouTube videos, Stephen C. Meyer, and you will see his argumentation, which I will represent to you in part, just part of his argumentation. Because of course, um, it's a whole book, it, it, it requires a lot more time. But the core of it I'm trying to represent. So my stumbled into the field because he was in a he was in in I think it was Texas and he was attending a, a conference. 
and um, they, he worked in a big industry and somebody in the conference told him about this other conference happening the next day about with these scientists coming in to talk about how this whole thing began. He said, that sounds interesting. He really had no research or interest in it before. He went out of pure curiosity. At the end of the conference, he gave up his big job for the industry, paying a lot of money. He went back um, to do a PhD on this, on this topic. And I think he went to Cambridge and, and he delved into this topic with, with, with real depth, created a lot of stir and created a lot of problems. <laughs> because, and, and, and here's the, again the, the thing, that when, when he first started publishing what he, was, what he was working on, the scientific community didn't treat it in a scientific way. They didn't treat it all. Now that is fascinating. That let is? us follow. Let mm -hmm. us follow the evidence. Correct. That's how science should treat anything that is an anomaly that emerges. They wanted to bury the evidence because it was inconsistent with the belief system that they hold, and that's why I keep going back to science is actually a religion. But I was about to say that because this religion didn't conform to their belief. So therefore, we got that jamming. Correct. So for him, on the point of evolution of the species, it is improbable to speak about chemical evolution producing life on its own without outside help. That's, that's his, his basic thesis. It is improbable to speak about chemical evolution producing life on its own without outside help. By outside help, we're talking about something that existed before the first living organism that we know and we could understand how it works is set up. Remember, all living organisms are set up around this DNA structure with amino acids, with, with, with all the complexity. Remember the double helix? Um, that's how it is set up. Before that was set up, if there was nothing we can't explain how the first simple single cell organism comes into being, is what he said. It's highly improbable to speak about it just coming into being just so, without the help. And math does not support the theory that it could have just come into being on its own just so. So follow me, follow me now. I've delving into a little bit of technicality here. But for species to have an origin, life had to first happen. So before Darwin could write the origin of species, you had to have the origin of, of, of life, the first simple organism. So, so let us look in the simplest primordial one cell organism, the simplest thing that we can ever find. And the fundamental question is, where did this first single cell organism come from? Right. That's, that's the question, okay? That's the question. Where did it come from? Well, Sir Fred Hoyle, who's a mathematician and cosmologist, he calculated the probability of producing all proteins necessary to produce a single cell organism. And the number, in this, the number is staggering. The number, and I want you to hear me clearly, eh? The number is one in a 10 to the 40,000th time. So it's 10 with 40,000 up on top of the 10, okay? One in 10 raised to the 40,000th 40, 40, time. Now that is that's more notes that I could start to think about, okay? <laughs> that's billions, billions of billions of billions. In other words, that is highly improbable. Correct. The probability of producing the first, just where, where we see the cell yet, eh? where, where is the living organism? All we're talking about is the proteins that are necessary to produce a single cell organism. Just the proteins, getting them right. 
is a staggering number. One in the 10th to the 40th, 40,000th time. Now, Myers concludes the probability of producing the proteins necessary to build a minimally complex cell or the genetic information necessary to produce those proteins by chance is unimaginably small. I want to use the word, eh? Remember they say by chance, eh? Everything, everything happened by chance, by natural, of natural selection or, or so on. So by chance, he is saying this is unimaginably small. And he's saying highly improbable. Not just, not just improbable, eh? highly improbable. Because you have to get the proteins, they are a lineup, then those proteins have to connect up in, in, a, in a form. And, and then you have to, to get them to be able to reproduce themselves, which means, as we will see, that means a whole lot of other information and a whole lot of processes invested in the first simple single cell organism that would have emerged. And, and this is, this is, I mean, looking at it from a whole other perspective. So the best explanation of the emergence of the first simple single cell organism, according to science, is that they were probiotic soup with all the elements just right, out of which the first simple single cell emerged. They had a little bit of lightning, and a little thunder, and a little boil in the pot, and 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 we, we cut down on, on the radiation and, and, and the long the long lights because the amino acids are very uh, they, they're very susceptible to, to light and, and therefore it, it, unless the conditions were absolutely lined up one hundred percent perfectly right it, it just could not it could not happen. And, and that probability is, is way out of, of, of all, all, all probabilistic argumentation for the first simple single cell originating without an outside intervention. And, and they starting to sound like, like witchery, eh? a probiotic soup with all the right elements and a little bit of lightning and a, and a little bit of, uh, of this and that and the next. And, Presto, bam, it comes into being. And, and this is, you know, this is really where science breaks down. Okay? Science could go from the first single cell, first simple single cell to us. They, 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 they could do that. But they, but they can't get that. They, the first one is the problem. <laughs> the first one, that, that's, that's the problem. Okay, so if we if we if we're going to do that, you know, Myers devotes a whole chapter, chapter nine, to demonstrating how absurd the hypothesis sounds when you want to, to argue that this is how life came into being. And, and it shows it pushes at the at the edges of it and shows that this don't make no sense. So let's talk a little bit now about DNA. Everybody remembers the, the double helix. We've seen it in images, Time Magazine, everybody's seen images of the double helix. But let's go below this, this, the single cell to the constitutive parts, the DNA, the RNA, and the protein molecules. Everybody know about RNA now because you know we have some <laughs> RNA, some vaccines that use RNA to inoculate us these days. Okay, so DNA, RNA, and the protein molecules as, a, as kind of your basic building blocks. We've all become very familiar with the image of the DNA molecule, the double helix. This is the most basic building block of life. But science has found that DNA not only communicates information, it also stores that information. And, hand, and reproduces it in handing it on. So the first simple single cell organism 
had to be able to not only communicate, but it had to store information that when it communicates, it could reproduce itself. Now this is, this, this is not a simple process for the beginning. It should start much simpler than this. But we can't find any, any way to get it simpler than that. Now, this is a game changer. I want you to think of a computer that stores information. It communicates information. But the DNA does one more thing. Its communication brings things into being. And that's very bit different. So a computer could store, it can communicate. But on its own, can it bring something into being? So the best analogy I could give you is this. Imagine a computer connected to a 3D printer that not only stores information, not only communicates with the 3D printer, but then it brings objects into being through the 3D printer, reproducing those objects in, in some form using whatever natural material it has. That's a very complicated process. But here's what the problem is, eh? The little, little problem, the little problem. The communication in the, in the DNA brings living organisms into being, not static dead organisms. The day when a computer communicating with a 3D printer or whatever brings a living organism into being, then you understand how complicated the process of forming the first simple single cell was. And, and with the computer, we come back in the analogy, somebody had to be the programmer. Aya. <laughs> it had to have a programmer. It, it, it itself could not get itself the programming required to be able to communicate and reproduce living organisms on its own without some programmer programming it. That's the problem. So they had to have some form of intelligent life in the beginning. Well, you know, there's where we're going. Ah, yeah. but, but here's here's the thing. The first simple single cell was more complex than the computer that we use it. It had more functionality in one, in one sense. It didn't, it, it didn't have, but in one it had more functionality than the computers that we have designed and that we are using. Our computers have an alphabet of, of two. They had an alphabet of four. Then the amino acids have an alphabet of 20. And the four and the 20, the communication there is what brings everything into being. Now, and, 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 and the communication is not just on a screen where somebody else could read. It actually brings life forms into being. It is that sophisticated. You can't have no intelligence bringing about intelligence that is that sophisticated without a programmer somewhere around programming the thing, if I use the analogy of the computer. You know, also, it is supposed to have achieved this and with no external, no external influence whatsoever. This is how Maya describes it. Huh? The chemical parts of DNA, the nuclear basis, function like letters in a written language or symbols in a computer code, just as letters in an English sentence or digital characters in a computer program may convey information depending on the arrangements. So too do the certain sequences of chemicals based along the spine of the DNA molecules convey precise instructions for building proteins. Like they precisely arrange zeros and ones in a computer program, the chemical base of the DNA convey information in virtue 
of their specificity. So how they are arranged brings a specificity. Your DNA determines the color of your skin, your hair, its texture, your height. It determines how you look. It determines all kinds of things about you. And that was communicated from your mother and father's body into you and brings you into being, okay? With all your specificity, the specificity that you are a human being and not a roach, an ant or a mouse is only the specificity of the communication within the DNA in its, in, in, in its wonderful complex. Another arrangement of the same parts, we would have had a rat instead of you. <laughs> or, no, no, you are, you are vegetarian. We would have had a corn tree. <laughs> because that too is based on, on, on DNA communicating with each other. So the, the Richard Dawkins notes that the machine code of the gene is uncannily computer-like. But software developer Bill Gates said, goes further. He says, DNA is like a computer program, but far, far more advanced than any software ever created. This Bill Gates, who has been the pioneer of developing um, the code that drives every bit of computer that we have in, in the world. And he's telling you that the DNA is like a computer program, but far, far more advanced than any software ever created. That, that, that's the clincher. How do we get something far more advanced? We, we have spent 200 years developing the computer as human beings. We've spent 400 years before that, 500 years before that, building the science and the scientific understanding of developing the computer. We've spent a couple thousand years figuring out the fire, the wheel, and, and moving to mechanics, moving to, to observation, science, et cetera, et cetera. And, and the first simple single cell is more complex than anything we have done in computer programming. Now, what does that tell? And it it's supposed to have happened by chance, by chance. What does that tell you? So we're talking about the first fundamental building block of life. That's what we're talking about. It was supposed to happen by chance. It is more sophisticated than any software ever created, Bill Gates says. I think he's the expert on, on that, not me. DNA is built on a four-letter alphabet that is used to communicate and build proteins. Proteins have their own alphabet of 20 characters. It is the interplay of the DNA and the protein that gives specific instruction to build specific forms of life. How they position how the, the alphabet in the DNA, how they position itself with the alphabet in the, in the protein, how they position themselves. That's how the specificity of a living organism is determined. Now you know why a couple of those boys, Ball, in our last show, said it confused them. <laughs> so we reach back to this point. Some superior intelligence or life force started the ball rolling. I want to use the ball rolling. Well, well let's say... It, if it was far, far more complex than any computer program that we have ever developed, they had to have a program. Let me, start, let me use the analogy. They had to have a programmer 
that program the first simple cell. It had to have a program because you, you don't stumble into such sophistication at the beginning. If you tell me that sophistication emerged over the process, well, we could, we could go with that. But, but at some point, this simple, most basic, most fundamental building block of all living organisms has the most compli complex communication system that brings about specificity in living organisms that we can see and observe with the naked eye. That, for me, is a, that's a game changer. Because now we have to say, okay, therefore, something was going on before the first living organism came into being. Otherwise, it couldn't be so sophisticated. So here's the question. How did no intelligence give birth to intelligent communication in the, in the most fundamental building block of life? That's, that's the question that I want somebody to help me to understand. And it's where the scientists are a little bit stumped because it's, it's, it, it really brings a, about a, a very big question. So the communication system between the amino acids, proteins, and the DNA are far more complex and sophisticated than any computer program or software that we have invented. And, and therefore, bringing it into being by nothing, random selection, probiotic soup with lightning flashing is a highly unscientific explanation of the origin of life. I like the soup with the light then flash it. You know, you had, you, had a, you had a picture, you had a picture, the brewing, you had a picture like a, a, a witch's brewing, because that's kind of how it sounds. But yeah. the point is, and this is the point, we could not do what we're doing right now without science. That's the point. But science has overstepped its mark, believing it could do what it, what, what it is doing without a meaning system. And that's, that's, that's the point. So I'm not, I'm not bashing the science or the scientists. What I'm saying is science is vital, vitally important. It has brought so much good for us as human beings. The fact that you and I could do what we're doing right now is only because of the science. But you have to stay in your lane. And once science gets out of its lane and starts to pronounce with, with absolute certainty about that which is not observable, we had to smell something wrong in you. We had to smell that science is moving from its, its area of incredible expertise to an area where it, it, it is not expert to make pronouncements. And that's, that's really the, the, the ongoing conversation. So the, the first living organism had a sophisticated communication process that brought into being specificity and thus diversity in all living things. Not only was it specific, the ant is the ant, the rice grain is the rice grain. It's not that the ant turns into a rice grain, but the basic building block is building both the ant and the rice, the mouse and, and the heist. <laughs> I'll leave that for you. The <laughs> mouse and the human is building, is the basic building block of everything that is living. And that basic building block is such an amazing, amazing piece of software programming that we can only say, Lord, when we see this, how, how else could we understand 
except that your love is amazing. Your, your wisdom is far beyond all of our expectations. Where did this sophisticated communication system come from is a question that is haunting. Haunting. And, haunting. Science, and science cannot answer that. It's haunting. And this is, yeah, this is a question that science has reached up to its edge on. So, you know, if you say, God, boy, these fellas must be smoking something because they're so happy. <laughs> okay, that's one way to say it. Here's what you need to know. What you need to know from this show is simple. Life as we know it came into being within time, within space, and it had a mat it had matter in a in a in a moment. There was no life, then there was life. And that transition is what we're talking about, from no life to life. And what we've seen through DNA and all its arrangements, how complex that is. And, and the complexity of what came into being that has evolved into all the species that we now know comes from the same root first single cell that existed, if that's how it started. That sophistication is something that is too much to really talk honestly about it emerging from chance. Amen. That's the that's simple nutshell. Too much to talk about chance. So where did it come from? That's the question. That's the real question. So if we look at the basic building blocks of life, DNA, RNA, proteins, and amino acids, we see a very sophisticated communication system that brings new species into being through the communication process itself. Where did the first DNA, RNA, protein come from? Where did it come from? That's, that's the question that we have to answer. What's the action step? I wanted to go to YouTube. I wanted to look at Stephen Meyer's YouTube videos and follow his reasoning. Don't, don't trust me on it. Go and, go and look for it yourself. Keep an open mind and listen to the case for intelligent design. Just listen to the case. The bashing that he gets on, on, on media or well, on, on social media is really testimony to the truth that science acts more like a religion than it does science, because it should only go after that which is observable. But it tries to demolish any other narrative that is counter to its narrative. And that's, that's where we have, have the challenge. So go and look for Stephen Meyer, M-E-Y-E-R. And the scripture reading comes from Wisdom 13, 1 to 9. Which, which says the, the, only the fool says there is no God. And then, and then the argument of, of look, at, look at this, and from, from looking at the creation, we can see the beauty and the truth and the, and the harmony that God brings. So let us pray now. Amen. Father, we thank you for your love, and we pray, Lord, that your grace is always up, upon us. Open wide our heart, Lord, that we may allow your grace to enter in. Open wide our heart, Lord, that we may, we may come with humility before you and really seek to know, to understand what is the truth of life and truth of all existence. We make our prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thanks a lot again, as Archbishop. Remember, he, he gave us some homework. Okay? Look at Stephen Meyer. Go up on YouTube. And also he gave us some homework last week too. To also go and pick up that little reading that we should read this guy's book. So we have some homework. And we want to thank Archbishop G for taking us into this conversation that we are having. God bless you Archbishop G. Happy Advent. Thank you so much. God bless. God bless.